I am Bill Doley, President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, and we carry out our nonprofit uh, preservation archaeology mission from here in Tucson, Arizona, and that's where Linda and I are tonight. We want to acknowledge the that we're on the traditional land and the homelands of the autumn people. Because we go out all across the, the nation, literally with these, these uh, talks, particularly the excited response we've gotten to the um, avian archeology span series, um, I want everyone to contemplate where you are tonight and the homelands of peoples, uh, indigenous peoples that uh, you are currently present on or living on and uh, take a, a thoughtful, thankful moment to reflect on that. And the other acknowledgement we wanna make at the outset on tonight's talk is to the Smith family. The Smith uh, family's living trust is what allows us to um, offer these cafes. Um, and it's an honor to be able to share this with so many people it will be appearing on a you know our, our youtube channel um, for friends of yours who may not have uh, been able to come tonight or so uh thank you uh eldon jean and <clears throat> jay for um, your support and i don't like long introductions so we're gonna move um, pretty quickly to our, our speaker tonight. I'm really thankful for Rachel, Rachel Berger to be joining us from Tempe. She's a senior archaeologist with Logan Simpson. Um, she specializes <clears throat> in uh, tribal consultation and collaboration, has a long-term personal research, um, which she'll be sharing uh, with you tonight on human-animal relationships and, and uh, in particular, and food security in classic period uh, <clears throat> populations of northern New Mexico. So without further ado, Rachel, thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, we're going to hear about a rafter of burials, Sapawinge turkey interments. It's all yours, Rachel. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Bill. So thank you, everyone, uh, Bill and Linda, for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak at the Archaeology Cafe. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk to you about turkeys from Sapa Uinge, more commonly known as Sapawe, which is an ancestral Tewa Pueblo in northern New Mexico. I'll discuss turkey husbandry at the site and a large interment or burial of several turkeys in a single room, and what this might show us about ritual practices and social institutions that guide them. But first, I'd like to acknowledge that this research is based in the indigenous lands of the Tewa. Sapa Uwinge is ancestral to present day OK Uwinge Pueblo, and I thank them for the opportunity to work with their heritage. So the cultural area I'm discussing tonight is the Tewa Basin, and that's the larger geographic area within the northern Rio Grande of New Mexico that is the spiritual and physical world of the Tewa. Sapawe, uh, which is marked here with a red star, is located in the lower Chama Valley of the Tewa Basin and is the homeland of present day Okeowinge. This area has famously been described as a Garden of Eden for resource availability and its cultivation potential, but we really know now that residents face just as much environmental uncertainty as past populations in other neighboring areas did too. Based on climactic reconstructions, the area was wetter and precipitation was more stable than neighboring regions. But this may have been a factor in drawing large populations resulting in the many sites that you can see in this image and um, possibly also the many pueblos that are still present in that area today. However, most of this precipitation would have come during the violent and unpredictable summer monsoon seasons that many of us are familiar with. El Rito Creek, where Sapawi is located, was a vital permanent water source and would have been subjected to seasonal flooding. 
The creek only runs seasonally today, but you can see from the trees in this image that it still holds a significant amount of moisture. So no archaeology talk is complete without a graph of what time period we're talking about. I'll mostly be discussing the classic period, which is roughly 1350 to 1600, depending on who you talk to. Uh, but it's important to understand what's going on in the region during that time and right before the peak of occupation at Sapawe. So I'll be talking about the coalition period a little bit too. Most of you may be more familiar with the Pecos classification and this classic period corresponds with the Pueblo IV period. We use a different chronology in the far north because cultural patterns and timing are a bit different there than they are from the Four Corners region. So the Rio Chama Valley where Sapawe is was mainly a resource area until drastic changes took place during the coalition period, roughly 80, 1200 to 1350. This includes uh, significant and rapid population growth and aggregation or the concentration of people, which we see in the increase in the number and size of residential sites. We also see evidence of intensified agriculture, um, particularly in practices like these cobble grid gardens and in reservoirs near sites. We also see regionalization in things like pottery production, suggesting that communities along river drainages were fairly insular. This time period is also likely related to the beginnings of Tewa ethnogenesis or the development of the Tewa as a distinct ethnic group. During this period, the Tewa began to build their landscape and negotiated their place, the Tewa Basin, within the northern Rio Grande. These patterns continued into the classic period, but the classic is really unique because of population coalescence, which is not only the physical coming together of people, but also the social and ideological changes that result in new social institutions and practices, um, creating a cohesive community and a strong Tewa identity. Social institutions are the structures and norms of society that organize us as a group. Um, think of either the Catholic Church or even kind of the family unit and the associated roles and traditional behaviors that go along with those. We call the behaviors from these norms practices, and they influence patterning in the archaeological record, too. Some archaeologists have attributed this reorganization in this time period as a response to declining environmental conditions also heightened uh, competition and conflict and migration of new settlers into the area. Others argue that these changes were the result of local growth and the stress that comes with that. What we do know is that agriculture further intensified and associated rituals developed too. This kind of led to an elaborate system of field and village border shrines, such as this world quarter shrine near Sapawe. These social and ritual technologies were tools to coordinate farming um, activities to ensure the success of future harvests and also to ease social tensions from ecological uncertainty. Also during this time period, ancestral Tewa populations peaked around AD 1480. Um, aggregation continued into the mid 16th century leading to population movement out of the Lower Chama and into the historic villages to the south along the Rio Grande. The cause behind the subsequent depopulation of the Chama has been contributed to the stress of continued aggregation and the impact of climatic degradation on plant and animal resources. Sapawe, which you can see here in this aerial image, was primarily a classic period Pueblo with a possible earlier and smaller occupation. So we know it was a residential location before it grew rapidly into this size. Sapawe is really the largest site in the Rio Chama and possibly even the largest adobe pueblo in the American Southwest. Um, it has approximately seven plazas, 24 room blocks, about 2,500 rooms, 23 possible kivas, and over 22,000 squared meters of living space. So we're talking about roughly two football fields in size here. Um, it's so large that it's really difficult to see in a map. Uh, what you're seeing here is a redrawn excavation map just to provide you with an idea of architectural layout. 
Sipawe was not fully excavated, so we don't know the layout of all of the rooms, but we do know from aerials and from those excavations where the room blocks were. Ceramic analysis and tree ring dating uh, provide us with an estimated date of 80, 1385 to 1525 for Sipawe as a large village. Most of those room blocks that you can see were established during the latter half of the 14th century and population peaked at over 2200 people during roughly 1450 to 1500. These large and numerous plazas were for that, for that high population and likely were the setting for public events such as communal feasts and ceremonial dances that drew people from other nearby villages as well. Something interesting to note is that porticos were common along the peripheral rooms and were used as covered outdoor activity areas um, and also for turkey pens. Turkey undoubtedly was the most widely consumed bird in the Southwest, which I'm sure everybody is pretty familiar with at this point. Um, their presence within late Pueblo archeological assemblages is pretty ubiquitous, especially in Pueblos like Sipawe, whose residents raise these domesticated birds in really large numbers. Turkeys also fulfilled many daily and ritual needs besides food. Their bones were used for making tools like awls and ceremonial items like whistles. Feathers were woven into blankets and the bird itself was closely associated with the earth and with springs. Interments of turkeys were also somewhat common during this period. Animal interments are intentional burials whose purpose served beyond the simple disposal of an animal's remains after their death. Several types of animal interments occur at Pueblo sites. Animal ritual refuse is what remains of an animal after it was processed for its resources, such as feathers, hide, uh, claws, or bone, to produce goods. Um, and animal refuse is identified archaeologically when animal skeletal remains amass within a location. Dedications are purposeful burials of animals as offerings that serve a purpose such as room closure. We identify dedications through their context and any accompanying artifacts that may have also had special significance like pottery, projectile points, or important stones like turquoise hematite and quartz. The final type of interment is simple interment or burials of animals with no evidence of bodily harm or important associations. And these may have been companion animals. Interestingly, Burials of turkeys have a deep history and were geographically widespread, indicating that their burial was a shared practice among Southwestern groups. Bird interments across the Southwest were most prevalent from AD uh, 1000 to 1400, but many different bird species were interred throughout time. We see this at Chaco and also in classic Mimbrez sites. In the Northern Rio Grande, interred birds were typically birds of prey during this time period, such as the turkey vulture, sparrow hawk, and red-tailed hawks. So turkey interments are really special in this region during this time. So all this background research really led me to three questions. Um, we know that turkeys fulfilled many needs for ancestral Pueblo people, both nutritional and religious, but these can sometimes be difficult to distinguish in the zooarchaeological record or the animal skeletal remains. I wanted to learn if the turkeys at uh, Sapawe and these interments were food trash or if they were something else. If they are interments, what do they reflect? Were they deliberate burials like a dedication or were they refuse from other ritual activities like harvesting materials? Also, if they're interments, what can they tell us about social institutions? What practices resulted in this pattern and can we infer, and what can we infer about social rules that the Sapawi residents may have followed? So this collection that I examined for this project um, was the result of six seasons of University of New Mexico field schools that were led by Dr. Florence Holly Ellis in the 1960s. Dr. Ellis excavated over 250 rooms and 11 kivas at Sapawe and conducted a limited landscape survey surrounding it. She was really interested in the origins of the Sapawe village residents. And as a result, she really focused extensively on the ritual material culture and kiva architecture. 
the results of these excavation efforts are largely unpublished and have fallen somewhat into obscurity until recently. Um, the collection and its archives are now housed at the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology at UNM and recently have been utilized by several archaeologists for research. What this also means is that Sapawi assemblage is what we call a legacy collection or materials from an old archaeological project that don't meet our modern standards. For this reason, archaeologists have tended to avoid these assemblages, but there are now established methods to work through these issues, and these collections really have a lot to give. Um, for this project, I worked a lot with the archives, especially the student notes, to fill in missing data about the animal skeletal assemblage and especially these turkeys. So it's also important to talk about kind of the general occurrence and use of turkey at Sapawe, especially the evidence for turkey husbandry, so that we can understand context for Sapawe turkey interments. Of the 14,000 bone specimens analyzed, nearly one third of the total assemblage was turkey and large bird, and most of those skeletal remains were actually food trash. This high number could be due to human population growth, <clears throat> And it could also be um, the result of a decrease in local wild game because of uh, increased demand on the surrounding environment. And this would have necessitated an increase in animal protein production, in this case, turkey, within the village. There's also research that argues that classic period ceremonial elaboration increased the demand for raw materials and that those needs were met through turkey husbandry because it's a reliable way to produce the resources that people needed. Either way, there's other evidence that turkeys were vital at Sapawe besides their large numbers, and that num evidence is the extent of turkey husbandry. The primary evidence is penning. Penning is identified archaeologically by accumulations of turkey dung, gizzard stones, eggshell, and baby birds within outdoor enclosures or indoor rooms. 31 of those 250 excavated rooms ended up being turkey pens at some point. Uh, these rooms were located in almost all of the plazas and time periods and really ranged in size. And so what this indicates is that turkey has been dreamed as a community-wide practice that really varied in intensity, with larger rooms being able to accommodate bigger rafters of turkeys. A lot of time and resources would have been necessary to raise that many birds to harvesting age, whether they were for food or for something else like feathers. And dogs are known to attack turkeys and are especially dangerous to young birds that can't fly or defend themselves. Sapawe, surprisingly, had very few identified dogs in the faunal assemblage. Limiting the number of dogs within the village may have been a tactic to protect turkey resources and residents' investments in their management. The other line of evidence for turkey husbandry is hobbling. Tethering hens by their legs to a stick driven in the ground and breaking wings to keep captive birds from flying off were common Pueblo practices that often resulted in deadly injuries for these birds. Several juvenile and adult turkeys at Sapawe had dislocated fractures that had begun to heal or were even fully healed before their deaths. Here you can see fractures to an adult right tarsometatarsis in the upper bone and a juvenile left tibiotarsis. These leg fractures were common tethering injuries and probably were in this instance too. Uh, turkeys are large, powerful birds and a bird trying to take off while tied up to a stick can easily break its leg from the force. Survival from these injuries is possible, but more likely if uh, someone intentionally splint the limbs to promote healing and to extend the lifespan of the bird. So during the summer of 1966, two students uh, excavating room DX11 discovered that the room contained a really large number of turkeys, more than any of the other excavated rooms at the site. And DX11 really was an average room. It was average in size, and it was located in the northern extension of the Plaza D Eastern Room Block and dated to uh, roughly early to late AD 1400. And while this is a large span, it does correspond to peak population at Sapawe and the peak of ceremonial elaboration as well. 
20 or more turkeys, 14 of which were fully articulated or resting joint to joint in correct anatomical position, were recovered in the room. We don't have photos, unfortunately, but we do have some very nicely done student field sketches that show us the positions that the turkeys were recovered in. Uh, the, these turkeys articulation and their positioning suggest that they were buried in the flesh and even tiny bones from sclerotic rings around the eyes and tendon bones in their legs were present. These turkeys were represented evenly by juvenile to old birds that were at or near full size and adult plumage when they died. Most of these turkeys, which you can see in the sketches, include the cranium, but only one of the crania exhibits hack damage from a blow to head. Cranial trauma on interred turkeys is actually rare, so this is really interesting. Besides the turkeys themselves, there's also some other interesting things going on in DX11. A young canine, possibly a dog, but really too young to know for sure, was also interred on the floor of this room with a turkey. Research suggests that the canine interment could have been part of a room closing ceremony. Um, and while rare turkey and dog interments have been recovered at other Southwestern Pueblo sites too. These animal burials are actually spread throughout the vertical fill, uh, the soil that filled the room, suggesting that most of the interments were separate events. There was another instance of a multiple, multiple interment, and that was two turkeys that were recovered in about one to five inches of soil above that canine and the turkey that were buried together. This proximity suggests that these four may have been buried as a single event, but a more definite conclusion about their association is really limited by the student excavation notes in this case. Again, this is interesting because interments with multiple animals are extremely rare and DX11 has at least one or two of multiple interments. Another interesting pattern is that there were few other artifacts recovered in DX11, which is atypical for Sapawa rooms. And the only other identifiable animal specimens were the portion of an American beaver cranium and a complete red fox cranium. Pellets from these animals were and still are utilized for ceremonial dress. So this could possibly be a clue to what those turkeys were being used for as well. So what can we conclude from the patterns in room DX11 compared to turkey use at Sapawe as a whole? First, we know that DX11 was rare. No other excavated room at Sapawe, especially those with this many turkey remains, had a similar pattern. High numbers of turkey in other rooms are clearly food trash. They aren't articulated and they are broken, burned, butchered, and chewed by humans. These food, food turkeys were processed in very different ways from the DX11 turkeys, which were buried whole and in the flesh. At some point during the occupation at Sapawe, it seems that residents turned room DX11 into a turkey burial or disposal room for birds that were harvested for their feathers. And there are several lines of evidence that support this. The deposit of the young canine on the floor suggests that this room was ritually closed or dedicated in some way. The subsequent interments after that show that DX11 was almost exclusively for turkey interment. Most of these turkeys included the cranium, indicating that the birds were probably strangled or smothered instead of killed by a blow to the head or decapitation, except in that one instance. Based on what we know through ethnographic studies conducted at Pueblos, the first two practices were common when birds were being killed for their feathers. Additionally, few other artifacts, uh, particularly special objects, were recovered in this room during excavation. So that lack of dedicatory objects suggests that the turkeys did not have a continued purpose after their burial. So what does this also tell us about social institutions at Sapawe? Um, remember that social institutions are the structures and norms of society that organize our behaviors or our practices. So from these interments and the patterning of other turkeys at Sapawe, I can infer that, that there were rules residents knew and, and followed about how animals were used. These turkeys, even during peak population, were not food and were not intended for anything other than whatever they were killed for, 
which we can probably conclude here was for their feathers. And this is significant because there must have been really strong social influences keeping people from eating these birds at a time when you had a very large number of people living at the site. Even more interesting is that there are ethnographic studies from the late 1800s and early 1900s that document rules about animal use, particularly about animals that were used in ritual versus those that were food. These rules were very prevalent within Tewa Pueblos and even dictated how animals were buried. So this could be another line of evidence that shows us that Tewa ethnogenesis, which was occurring during the coalition and classic periods and ritual elaboration, were occurring during this time and during the occupation of Sapawe. So given this patterning in turkey use, we can infer that some aspects of these Tewa ritual institutions and their rules were in place during the occupation of Sapawe. This also shows us that Tewa social institutions have time depth and given the widespread practice of turkey internment within the American Southwest, possibly also have even deeper origins. So thank you to everyone for attending tonight and thank you for Archaeology Southwest for hosting me and the many institutions that made this research possible. Um, thank you very much, Rachel. That was, that was wonderful, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, we just had a visitor who didn't have a question, but they, he says, kudos to this young woman for a cognitive, cogn thorough and very informative presentation. Oh, well, thank Cogent. you. Sorry, I can't type. Tonight, but anyway, uh, kudos there for you. Um, yeah, I can't speak. So this may be fun for me to ask questions, <laughs> won't it? <laughs> No, so we've got some questions. They're rolling in, and if people have questions, just type them in the in the Q and A, and we will. I'm going to start throwing some toward Rachel here. Um, before we dig into the 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 turkey stuff a whole lot, um, early on there was a question. You showed a picture of something that was a, called a a world quarter shrine. Yeah, I, I can wonder if you could again. tell us a little bit more about what that might be. Yeah. Um, so we call them world quarter shrines, but uh, that's probably what, not what they really are. So the um, this image, it's really hard to capture how big these are. And so this is kind of a bubble lens photo of these world quarter shrines. And they were dubbed this when they were kind of first discovered, but these are really just border shrines. And um, Sam Dewey at Oklahoma has actually done a lot of research on these. Mm -hmm. And these are probably just establishing kind of the Tewa world around the site. And the, the world quarter shrines being one of kind of the border shrines that is kind of the transition zone between sort of uh, village property and, and external property. Mm, okay. Okay. That sounds good. Good. Let's see here. I'm looking at the questions here. <laughs> So I, I just want to clarify, and I think that you did speak about this, but um, there was there have been some other questions. It looks like at Sapawe, a lot of the turkeys were eaten. Oh yeah. And then there are these this evidence that there are clearly some other kind of turkey, turkey being used for something else that was not eaten. And right, that that was what you were saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, just the sheer number of bird at the site is it's a lot a third of the assemblage is really high, even for a Pueblo this size. Um, and most of those birds were definitely being eaten. And like I said, um, you know, there's really not any other articulated turkeys in any other place in the Pueblo except this room. Um, and these turkeys, they show no signs of having been, you know, skinned or defleshed or any of those. And you just have that one turkey that has that kind of damage to it. Right. Um, so it's possible that these turkeys were earmarked early on as kind of feather birds <clears throat> compared to the food birds that we see in the other rooms. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and sort of on that too, is there was a question about that, that photo you had of the desiccated turkey mm -hmm. that seemed to still have feathers on it. Yeah. Was, so was that buried or, or that is actually an example from, um, not Sapawe. Okay. <laughs> Um, that is a desiccated one that was found in a cliff dwelling. Okay. And so we do in some instances, you know, across the Southwest in areas where conditions are great, um, find 
whole turkeys that have you know feathers still on them um and this one here is just is an example of what kind of an interred bird looks like mm -hmm. yeah no that, i think our our viewer caught picked up on that like i don't think it would have been buried and still had feathers so <laughs> yeah I, I think she was just asking for clar clarification on that yeah that's good good thank you yeah um, let's see, were there any, and, and did you, I think you may have talked about this, but there weren't any artifacts or anything with these turkeys, right? They're just, no, I mean, old, there was some, yeah, kind of some random stuff in the fill, um, you know, shirred fragments and, mm -hmm. um, some other little bits here and there, but in comparison to the other rooms at Sapawe that were excavated, there's very few artifacts in mm -hmm. this room. Um, nothing else that was intentionally placed with these birds. Yeah. And any clue, especially given that there were so few dogs, any clue why there would be a dog and turkey together? Um, we do know from other Pueblo sites and research that's been done that dogs are often used as kind of dedications or as room closures. And so it could have been that this room was actually being dedicated by burying the dog as maybe an interment room um but you know that's that's just kind of speculation on my part mm -hmm. um we don't really have any you know a lot of other instances or ethnographic research that supports you know a definite uh interpretation of what this room was being used for Okay. Yeah, we, we like speculations and <laughs> some of us people who are just asking questions. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> talking about using the birds for feathers, can you remove feathers without killing the bird? Um, or... um, so you, well, typically within Pueblos, the practices are either that the birds are first um, smothered and then fully plucked, or feathers are collected as they're naturally shed. Right. Um, if you pluck a full bird while it's still living, it's not going to be a good situation for the bird. It's very stressful um, and would probably kill the bird from the shock. So, right. um, yeah, okay. not best practice. Okay. So, yeah, they would have either been, they could have been doing both, they could have been gathering feathers as they molted, but also exactly. could have been pl plucking right. for some reason needing, needing bird. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, there's so many lovely questions about feathers. <laughs> ah, you know, we've heard something about telling, diff identifying different kinds of turkeys and things like that and DNA and all that. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of questions I can tie together, which is um, one person was asking about our, have you, you, have you seen the actual turkey bones that those students excavated and have you studied those? Yes. Yeah. And then sort of tying in with that is, is have you done any work to identify whether that's a different kind of turkey than what they're eating? So I haven't done the work, but I've collected the data. So um, one of the ways we can tell is through skeletal measurements as to whether ah. these are um, kind of a wild type of turkey or if these are a domesticated type. And a lot of that's actually being done now with DNA analysis. Mm -hmm. um, but I did not do any DNA, DNA analysis on these birds because OK Wingy doesn't want any kind of destructive analysis done mm -hmm. for um, any you know collections that they have association with. So no DNA in this instance. Okay. But you think you could get at it from measurements potentially? Yeah, you could do some of it from measurements. Um, not with the juvenile birds though. Yeah. So there's very few birds at Sapawe where the correct bones are present to do those kind of analyses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's been a couple of questions. I think it could be interesting to chat about that for a little bit and we can go back to turkeys in a bit but um folk have, are sort of interested in um understanding more about um what kind of information gaps um are are in these kinds of legacy collections this historical digs what are some of the challenges of using those kinds of collections yeah that's a really great great question actually um one of the big things that is kind of a uh 
pitfall to using this collection is that it was dug in the 60s and standards at that time for excavations were very different. And Dr. Ellis and her students did not screen any of the soil that they excavated. And so there's a definite bias in this collection against small bones, small animals and small birds too. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of does skew the numbers quite a bit, but um, there are ways to kind of get around that statistically. So a lot of the analyses that I did uh, tried to address some of those issues. And then the archival research is also a great way to get around some of those problems. Um, these legacy collections, because they tend to be in original excavation bags and were never inventoried, um, the bags themselves are missing a lot of information. So it can be hard, you know, you have a bag of bone and you're like, oh, it says, you know, it's from room DX11, but it doesn't say which level it's from, but I have the date on the bag. So I can go back to the student notes and find the date and they'll be like, you know, July 12th, we started and finished level 10. And so that's kind of another way to fill in those bits and pieces. Um, and so this project was really, you know, half animal skeletal analysis and half archives research, trying to piece together all that information. Is there, um, is there other research being done on the Sapawe collections? Yeah, um, there is a student, um, well, she graduated with her master several years ago who did the ceramics um, mm. and looked at kind of a, a ceramic type specific to that region. And then uh, there have been other students at University of New Mexico who um, looked at some of the faunal stuff. Um, Laura Steele looked at some of the, the fauna from different rooms. And then um, Jonathan Dombrowski looked at some of the flutes and whistles. Um, and then uh, there's something I'm forgetting. I mean, uh, this, so Pauly's also been used for a lot of bigger studies too over the years, looking at ceramic types. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah. Excellent. No, I mean we like we like uh, I, I like we like to, I like to see you know work being done on legacy collections. Um, part of our preservation archaeology mission is is the uh, the idea that there's still a lot to be learned in those collections sitting on shelves and exactly and you know it's a way for us to look at you know big data Sapawi gives us big data mm -hmm. um, in a way that's not more destructive because we're not excavating new sites mm -hmm. um did did you speak with the uh folk from Okeowenge? did was there any reaction from them to what you learned or what you were doing so they're aware of the project um and for various reasons, I haven't been up there to present any of this, mostly COVID, mm -hmm. um, but that's something I hope to do in the future. Yeah, 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 I, that, that's what I figured, yeah. Yeah. Excellent, thank you, thank you. Has there been any, here's one, has there any similar work done at the other nearby sites up there, like what, Sama, and what's the other one? Um, so, Scott Ortman and his students have been doing some work up there and um, there are no new excavations going on in that region. Um, but there are students that have been looking at other zooarchaeological assemblages like Ponsipa. Um, mm -hmm. And there have been ceramic studies that have been looking at other assemblages as well. Mm -hmm. um, but no new excavation has been going on in this area. Um, and a lot of those sites were dug and some of them were dug in kind of in the 60s and 70s as uh, road highway projects. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've gotten you off on the site questions. We'll go back to turkeys in a minute. But <laughs> okay. um, can you clarify what's the current um, state of this of um, Sapawe? What what kind of land? Where is is it protected? What kind of land is it? Um, so the majority of it is New Mexico state lands okay. and is managed by that office a small portion of it is actually on private property. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Maybe a preservation opportunity there. <laughs> um, somebody wants to know about that ceramic bird effigy that you showed us at the end. Oh yeah. Um, it has a deliberate hole in it, um, right? Do you have any idea what that is? Does have, yeah. Um, 
I don't, you know, it, this is from the Sapawi collection. Um, I mean, it, it could have been tied to a number of things. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if anybody's actually looked at this to try to provide some interpretations for what it may have been. Hmm. Hmm. Well, can't hurt to ask. <laughs> Um, is it common for Pueblo Four villages to have rooms used exclusively for animal interments like at Sapawe? Is is that happen in other villages? Do you know? Um, so first to clarify, that room was probably not built to be a interment room. Mm-hmm. So it was probably habitation or storage at some point. And then once people kind of moved out of that portion of the village, it may have been dedicated as an interment room. Um, in the reading that I've done, I've not been able to find evidence that there was something similar at this scale at other Pueblos. There's certainly other instances of turkey interments with multiple turkeys in a room, but not, you know, 20 plus birds in one space. Which is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Do you have, do you have any idea? I mean, what do you know about turkeys and in history in general? Um, Do you know any, any idea about how the use of turkeys like this compares to like turkeys in other parts of the U.S., like the East, Eastern turkeys or, you know, something outside of the Southwest? Yeah. You know, I'm really not familiar with, besides food, what possible ritual uses of turkeys outside of the Southwest could have been. Mm. There is some really cool research coming out of the Eastern US about turkeys and possible um, turkey husbandry out there. But I don't know if anybody's really been looking beyond that for, you know, non-food uses. Um, I'm sure it exists, I'm just not aware of it. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, well, we're always interested in turkeys, so yeah. And I know you touched on this a little, but do you have anything more specific about like the specific ages and sexes of your turkeys that were interned? Right. So um, one or two of the turkeys in the room, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, were definitely male. And that's because one of the leg bones kind of had that um, spur on it that the gobblers tend to have. Um, However, that can also be a difficult metric to use to distinguish sex because some female turkeys also have that spur. And so there's kind of a back and forth about whether, you know, does the size of the spur indicate if it's male versus female? Um, And then as far as age goes, the majority of them were either kind of young adults, so not, you know, fully adults, but had reached sexual maturity as far as, you know, turkey age goes. Um, evenly split between kind of juvenile, young adult, and adult. And then there was one turkey that was pretty old. Hmm. And, and, but most of them were, you know, younger than that. Hmm. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And from what you can tell from the notes, and this may be hard, but from what you can tell, they did not select this room because they thought that there were turkeys interned in there or anything. This was just a room they were exploring and yeah so the way um ellis excavated this site and i'll go back to the photo to show you an example is they came with a bulldozer and just scraped off the top surface to expose the tops of the rooms and that's how they knew where they were going to excavate for that summer so when she dug these rooms she just picked you know a room block and they just cleared them out completely as you can see in this photo Um, So she didn't choose this room specifically, but she did choose that portion of Sapawe that summer because she was trying to get kind of a chunk of rooms from all across the Pueblo. Um, And she was out there for a total of seven summers. Big project. So how much do you know about the care of turkeys? Because we've had a couple people asking about how hard is it to Take care of a turkey. Just how yeah, much work I, I is know, involved? Yeah, I know a somewhat decent amount about it. Um, that's kind of another side project I'm working on. Oh, ah, okay. This might have been a plant question. Then. It may have been. <laughs> <laughs> Not for me, but. But we're interested. We'd like to know more about 
how hard it is to care for a turkey. Yeah. So, um, gosh, where to start? Um, you know, one of the things about turkeys is that they need fresh water. And oftentimes they will not drink from like stagnant water. And so Sapawi being close to the El Rito Creek is actually really interesting because it would have been easy for people taking care of their turkeys to go and get water for these birds. Um, they're called obligate drinkers. They don't get enough water from their food every day. So they have to supplement with fresh water. So that's really important. Um, the other thing that's important is that sickly turkeys do not lay eggs. So um, we know that these birds are laying eggs because we do find a lot of eggshell in the collection and we find a lot of baby turkeys too. And for a hen to be able to lay, she needs to have a certain amount of calcium during the laying season. And one of the interesting things is that if these turkeys, let's say, were being supplemented with corn, which is, you know, one of the big research things that's going on right now is um, looking at stable isotopes in the bones and being able to see that they were feeding these turkeys corn, a hen would not have been getting enough calcium from corn to be able to lay eggs. And so they would have had to let these turkeys forage uh, for other, you know, wild resources that they were used to eating to get all the nutrients they needed. And so taking care of these birds was probably somebody's full-time job. Um, and because they're distributed so widely across the Pueblo, what we're probably seeing is different family groups taking care of their own birds. Um, so a lot of time by each family and resources probably being invested, taking care of these birds, um, trying to get them to a mature enough age for whatever they were harvesting them for. Um, the nice thing about you know, raising young turkeys is they tend to stay very close to their mother. And so if you have like a hen, you know, tethered in uh, an outdoor plaza area, all the poults, the baby turkeys will stay close. So that makes it a little bit easier to kind of wrangle the birds around. No, thank you. That's very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. A um, few more questions, but we're getting to the end of them, actually. Um, <clears throat> one question more about if you've got any more diet um, analysis. I don't know. If, yeah, but what were the food birds found in rooms or in trash middens, or is that one and the same? And is there any indication of um, you know how much turkeys made up? protein in the diet as opposed to other sources? Do you have any, any data on any of that stuff? Yeah, I do have data on that. So um, the first part of the question, the, these rooms are filled with trash. And that is how um, people were kind of disposing of everything was just, you know, either throwing it into empty mm -hmm. rooms or it had blown into empty rooms at some point. So um, yeah, that they're kind of one in the same in this instance. Um, as far as how much the turkeys are being relied upon for residents for food, that really shifts through time. And so when Sapawe is first established, we actually see a very high number of turkeys, which is surprising because you think that you would see the turkeys peak kind of when the people peak. And um, what I think was going on is actually when a whole bunch of people were aggregating at Sapawe to live together, they were probably bringing turkeys they already had with them. And so that's why you see a high number and you also see um, a high reliance on turkeys as food from the beginning and into the middle period of occupation. But towards the end of occupation at Sapawe, when we have a lot of evidence that um, social structure is kind of falling apart there and people are starting to leave for other places, we actually see Turkey drop out. And I don't think it's that uh, people don't have turkeys anymore. It's just that um, they're putting less of their resources into raising the birds and probably more of their resources in, into um, shifting their lives elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Um, 
we talked, touched, maybe we went around this, but um, can you speak at all about um, like contemporary reliance on by, by indigenous folk today on turkeys in the Southwest? Um, Not really. I mean, yeah. I know there are people that raise turkeys in traditional ways and um, partly to collect feathers. And most of those people that I know, they don't um, smother their birds or kill them before collecting the feathers. They actually collect natural shed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And any way you can tell, were they eating eggs or were, they, were the eggs producing more turkeys? Oh, what a good question. Um, <laughs> so I do know that the eggs were producing more turkeys because there are a lot of very young, I mean, so young that they're possibly still in the eggs. Yeah, teeny tiny itty bitty bones. Um, and so they are raising turkeys. A lot of the eggshell at Sapawe, it's really busted up and it was not stored well. And so it's not possible to really know if these were eggs that were opened up, you know, by humans to eat eggs or if they were actually, you know, broken after the fact because a turkey hatched out of them. Um, there is some really neat research that was done um, with microscopy to that looked at the cracking in eggshells to see if they were cracked out from the inside or if they were from the inside. Um, but the Sapawe collection is just in such a state that I don't think that's possible. That's cool. Yeah. I, I like turkey eggshells. I had a I had an interaction with turkeys inside eggs at Hamalabi oh, four, geez. three, which one of those anyway, but I've always had a soft spot for turkeys inside eggshells. So <laughs> So a um, couple more questions. We got a little bit more time. Folk are interested in like, do the, do the bones have any of the bone turkey assemblage have like cut marks or burning on them? And I think that's sort of related to another question about, do you have any idea how, how do you cook a turkey if you're going <laughs> to eat it or how yeah. they might have been cooking a turkey? Yeah. Um, so there's really not a lot of burning on the turkey bone. And so we do see some cut marks, like maybe they were being skinned and processed and chopped up and, you know, possibly being added to pots and boiled in water or other foods and cooked that way. Um, the little bit of burning that we do see is also from burned rooms. And so it's really hard to know if the burning is from the birds being processed for food or if it's because um, the trash itself was being burned. Mm, okay, okay. Great, yeah. And I got a couple more minutes. We'll ask a couple more questions. Um, the birds in DX11, the 20 plus, um, you think they were all, do you have any sense, were they all buried at the same time? Do you have any idea about the time period that got them buried or is that just hard because of the notes? Yeah, well, it is hard because we don't have a lot of other artifacts or even things like charcoal that could be dated to kind of give us an idea of time. Mm -hmm. But what we do see is that um, the birds are spread throughout the vertical fill. So there's a lot of soil in between each of those mm -hmm. instances of an interment. And that soil would have either been windblown in or deposited in by humans. Um, and so it's very likely that these were all separate events throughout time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And... I mean, I don't know if you have a, in a sense, but do you have any idea about what kind of social hierarchies might have been in existence there at Sapawe that would have maybe had played into this? Would would like would ritual turkey interment been a practice of like elites or something? Or do you have any real sense of what this might what might be going on there? Yeah. So what we're probably seeing is actually um, maybe a sodality, a ritual group that's harvesting these birds. And so that doesn't tell us too much about social structure, but it does tell us a lot about kind of the ritual structure. And um, given the sheer number of kivas at Sapawe and other ritual rooms that we also know about from Florence um, excavations, there's a lot of these different ritual sodalities that are kind of doing their own thing. And so um, it's very likely that this room was associated with one of those groups for their purpose. Um, and so that doesn't tell us much about social structure, but um, yeah. 
Is um sounds like there's been a lot a number of people working on these legacy collections. Is there any kind of joint publication coming out on Sapawe or anything like that that we can look for that gathers it all in one place? <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is some stuff that I'm working on on Sapawe, but there isn't anything really joint coming out. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of this, what I'm working on is came out of my dissertation research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is um, some work being done by um, archaeologists like Tom Wines and Pete mm. McKenna, who were students of Florence Holly Ellis's and at the original excavations in the 60s. Um, and they were and have been trying to get a lot of this together to kind of publish like the story of, you know, excavations at Sapawe so that we have that information captured. But then COVID hit. And so, <laughs> yeah. That would crazy. be great. Yeah. yeah. I hope they can get that done. That would be these kinds of excavations. We need that kind of as much as we can record yeah, happen we, while we still can. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of those people have institutional knowledge about right. this site that, you know, I had to talk to them to learn about some of the ways Ellis excavated because her personal notes aren't really in the archives. So mm -hmm. if they could capture that information, then, you know, other researchers would have access to that as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Well, thank you. I have a one final question, which is, not a question, but a very fine presentation and discussion. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank <laughs> so, you. Oh, <laughs> really I funny. think we uh, got through most of them and it's running up to seven o'clock. So I think we can call Bill back and um, thank you so much, Rachel. This was really interesting. Oh, well, thank you but for I have having a me. soft spot for turkeys. So, <laughs> Bill. You know, I'll reiterate that. Thank you, Rachel. Very well done and very enjoyable. Um, two things I wanted to. Um, sort of have, a, I saved this to the end, um, but kind of sad news for those of you who probably knew her, Sharman McCusick passed away um, in late March, uh, March 26. She was 90 years old, uh, truly a pioneer in avian archeology span and um, just wanted to uh, let people who hadn't, may not have heard about that uh, be aware of that and Another much more um, happy event is coming soon, which is the magazine that is going to be the compilation of um, not only the presentations that have been done during the cafe, but a, a whole series of additional uh, authors and, and uh, opportunities for um, sharing information about avian archaeology. So we saw kind of a mm, beyond a rough draft today uh, version of the, the magazine and it's coming together beautifully. And I would hope that um, at the time of our final number eight um, of our avian archeology span cafes, which is gonna be held on the first Tuesday in May again, May 3rd this time, where um, we'll give you an update on, on the status of that um, magazine issue. It's going to be about 60 pages long and beautiful. Um, so that next uh, talk on May 3rd is going to be by Christopher Schwartz, Patricia Gilman, and Stephen Pog. And they'll be talking about birds of the sun, macaws, parrots, and people. So please plan to join us then and uh, we'll get you the details on how to get this magnificent magazine that's coming up out soon. So Thank you so much, Rachel. Really appreciate it. No, oh, thank you. It's been this has been really fun. Great. Thanks for everyone who joined us tonight.